Good evening, GYC. How many enjoyed your Sabbath here in Baltimore? And it was a high Sabbath. We didn't just have a New Year's celebration. Praise God, we were able to keep God's Holy Sabbath day as well. And it was a wonderful experience. Last night as I was slowly making my way back to the hotel, I saw where a whole group of young people just broke out in songs of praise in one of the upper uh, open areas. And it was so powerful that I actually just went up on the upper level and looked down on it and just thank God for the outpouring of his Holy Spirit as the young people just sang. And I, I could just imagine that there were angels that were so pleased to see God's people in praise as the rest of the world was in partying and, and, and frivolity. God's people were praising him to bring in a new year. And I just ask that God would bless us as we look at um, what is going to take place in 2011. Some of the things that they've been presenting here tonight is Babylon, like Babylon rising. These things are, are exciting. I don't know if you've ever been to Vegas, but they call it Sin City for a reason. And so I ask that God would be with them as they go into Las Vegas and bring uh, the gospel truth, these uh, precious end time message to the city of Las Vegas. So we will be praying for them. Amen. Uh, yesterday also I was able to go to um, some of the booths after we were talking. We actually wound up having our own little church service over here in front of um, Vision and, and Little Light um, Studios booths over here. And uh, I just want to say after meeting them that I, I'm going to be a strong supporter of their ministries and really try and get more people, at least in my area in Southern California, to see what they're doing. I want to say that we should have a spirit of teamwork. If the people of God work together, guess what happens? Synergy happens. And more happens when we work together and when we support one another than if we try and all do it by ourselves. So we ought to have a spirit of, of, of not just unity, but of synergy, working together to finish God's work on earth. I want to ask you to turn with me in your Bibles tonight to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And I'm going to read verses 7 and 8. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. The Word of God says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Our message tonight is entitled, Claim Your Crown. Claim Your Crown. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for bringing us together again here at GYC for another evening service. I ask right now, Lord, that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail, Lord. But I ask, Lord, that you would hang a portrait of Jesus Christ upon that nail so that tonight, Lord, Eric Walsh is not seen or heard. Instead, Father God, I ask that we would hear a message from the very throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. As Paul is laying in the dungeon, and as he is dealing with the difficulties of being alone, he tells us in 2 Timothy that most have actually deserted him and have left him alone. Paul, as he's laying on the floor in the dungeon, soldiers come running down the stairs and they grab the apostle Paul. They shake him up and tell him it is time for him to go and stand in the hall of justice. I can imagine as Paul is dragged through the streets of Rome that many of the soldiers or some of the soldiers would have whispered to him, Paul, make sure when you get here and you have an audience with these dignitaries and with the emperor that, Paul, you don't lift up the name of Jesus. Paul, if you do that, 
They'll put you to death. As Paul is dragged into this hall, as he enters in, there are dignitaries from all over the Roman Empire seated in array before the Emperor Nero. But not only are these dignitaries present outside of the hall, the regular citizens, the, the, the street uh, uh, common person of Rome is gathered outside, pressing in, wanting to hear what would happen to someone who was so hated by Rome. You see, by lying on the Christians and hence lying on Paul, they, they got all in Rome to believe that, that Paul was responsible for the fire that destroyed three-fourths of the city. He was a, a hated man by this point for those who did not know him. And so there was a crowd kind of reminiscent of, of, of the kind of attention that something like the O.J. Simpson trial received. But Paul was in chains when he was brought in. And he, and most of the people there would have thought that Paul was a prisoner of Nero. But Paul makes it clear in his writings that Paul was a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Paul makes it clear that he was only in chains because he chose to be a servant of Jesus Christ. And at one point in that terrible night, the aged, feeble Apostle Paul is brought to stand face to face with the Emperor Nero. Paul, God's most powerful agent on earth, stands before the most powerful human being on earth. Nero, in essence, the ruler of the world, stands before Paul, who is the servant of the king of the universe. The spirit of prophecy, as well as the ancient historians tell us that there has been no greater contrast between two men as when the Apostle Paul stands face to face with the great emperor of Rome. What a contrast. You see, Nero came to power on a river of blood. His mother, Agrippina II, married his uncle, Claudius Caesar. Claudius Caesar was known to be a weak emperor, and Agrippina was told by astrologers that her son Nero would one day rule Rome, and so she, she jockeyed her position and, and actually uh, assisted in the death of Claudius' wife and then married a man she was related to. She got her son in position, and once she got uh, Claudius to, to say that Nero, in, in, in case of Claudius' death, would be made emperor, it wasn't very long before Claudius was dead. After Claudius died, Nero's stepbrother Britannica, most loved of all of the Roman citizens, uh, a noble young man, was poisoned at the dinner table while all of them sat there and ate leaving Nero alone to rule the then known world as the emperor of the Roman Empire. But I learned a long time ago, there's no honor among thieves. And it wasn't long after Nero took power that he was looking to kill his own mother. In fact, Nero had made multiple attempts to kill his mother. Most of them failed until finally he hired assassins and had his mother killed at the hands of trained professional assassins. Nero, when he married Octavia, his first wife, divorced her and then killed her. And then his second wife, he kicked to death shortly after marrying her because she asked him had he been out chariot racing that night. The contrast between this bloody, murderous, hedonistic leader and the simple yet eloquent Apostle Paul is a dramatic contrast. 
Because you see, Nero had only three loves in life. Nero loved poetry and singing. In fact, when he would sing, and many of the, the senators and the elite of Rome thought it was so beneath the emperor to try and perform. I remember when Bill Clinton used to play the saxophone, there were those who kind of thought the same thing. And he would sing, and the problem, of course, was he had soldiers around the auditorium, and if someone, when he was done singing, didn't clap loud enough or shout loud enough for Nero, Nero had them put to death. It was a capital crime if when he performed, enough people didn't applaud. But he also thought he was an actor. And living in California, everybody thinks they're actors. And so he, he would go and he would perform in the theater, and, and if the people didn't like his performance, if he, if he thought someone didn't appreciate his performance, Nero would have that individual put to death. But his other great love, his third great love was chariot racing. Nero loved to race chariots, horse-drawn um, horse chariots, and, and, he, and he was uh, su in such love with it. I told you on the first night that even when he, when he began the persecution of the Christians because uh, of, the, of the burning of Rome and trying to deflect the blame from off of himself, Nero would use the Christians, put them up on posts, and, and set them on fire, and he would drive his chariots through the, the, the burning torches that were Christians. So much he loved charioteering that Nero decided to postpone the 8065 Olympics for two years so he could practice. Being the emperor, he delayed the, the great Greek games and for two years and he practiced chariot racing, but, but Nero was a crooked type of guy. So what he did was he bribed the judges and when the time came for him to race in 8067, Nero when everyone else only had four horses on their chariot, Nero had ten horses on his. It's kind of funny because not only did he have ten horses, but he wasn't really that good of a chariot, charioteer as you would imagine. And so in the race, after bribing the judges to allow him to have ten horses, he doesn't fall once as he's racing, he falls twice as he's racing. In fact, there are some historians that he almost died one from the second fall from the chariot. In fact, Nero never finishes the race. I'm going to say that again because it's important. Nero never finishes the race. But he bribed the judges so well, and being the emperor of Rome, the judges make a decision that had he finished the race, he was so good that had he finished the race, he would have won the race. History tells us that he began to tour all over, collecting crowns from all of the different races in Greece. And ironically, he began to collect the crowns and brought all of the crowns back to Rome. He put them on separate uh, 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 chariots and, and had them displayed. He wore one on his head and he rode back into Rome triumphant with the plant crowns of the Olympics, bragging as if he had gone and won the race fair and square. Paul is a different man. Paul had traveled all over the empire as well. But he had not traveled all over the empire looking to gain crowns that would not last. Crowns that, as he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, Paul says that those crowns were corruptible. Paul had gone around the empire and he had been building up churches and, and training people uh, for ministry. He had been preaching the gospel. He had been, he had been, he had been debating and, and winning over the Gentiles and even the Jews. Paul, unlike Nero, did not have to buy affection. It was said that if a, Nero had his eye on a woman and she did not take his advances, that he would instantly command that she be put to death. 
Paul, on the other hand, the striking contrast between the two men. Paul, when he would leave, be leaving a church and the church would come together to pray for, for Paul, that when Paul was leaving, the people of the church would fall on him and kiss him and tell him they loved him. And Paul didn't have to buy their affection. But let me tell you what happens as Paul and Nero face off. The time comes for Paul to defend himself because he was so hated in Rome that there were, he could not find any attorney or any legal representation for himself. So Paul had to defend himself. But it worked to God's glory. Because although Paul was warned that if he went up in front of this group of dignitaries and, and for the waiting mob to hear, although he was warned that if he lifted up the name of Jesus, history and the spirit of prophecy tells us that when Paul stands at a podium probably more beautiful than this one and begins to speak, he preaches his most powerful sermon. So powerful a sermon that many of the people in the room who came to see him convicted and put to death, actually their hearts melt and they are convinced or convicted of the reality of Jesus Christ. In fact, when you read the spirit of prophecy in the book Acts of the Apostles, face, uh, when, and the chapter that describes when Paul and Nero come face to face, Ellen White tells us that even Nero a light from heaven shines down through the dark, uh, a seemingly impenetrable soul that is Nero, and even Nero begins to contemplate eternity. Because you see, Paul doesn't go up there and preach a weak sermon. Paul preaches a sermon on the judgment. Paul stands before this big and respectable crowd of people. And Paul says, listen, one day, every single one of you is going to have to stand before the very judgment seat of the living God. Paul says he's a loving God and he's a merciful God, but if you stand before him and you stand before him uncovered by the blood of his son, untouched by the grace and mercy that is uh, embodied in his son Christ Jesus, you will not be able to stand. The Emperor Nero begins to realize that all of the sick and twisted, debaucherous acts that he's performed will one day he will have to give an answer for. And in that moment, he begins to contemplate his own eternity. Paul preached the God of the universe. Nero preached that he was God. In fact, people set up altars to Nero, and they would worship him. And when Nero built his, his, his palace, like I said last night, he erected a 120-foot statue in honor of himself. What a contrast between Nero and Paul. But I submit to you it was a powerful sermon. And Paul is being drugged back to his dungeon after preaching this sermon. You can imagine that there are those whispering, he's finished. They're going to kill him. But Paul writes the book of 2 Timothy after that incident. And I want to read 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting at verse 1. I want you to understand that after his experience with this crazy tyrant Nero, he pens words that are powerful. He says, I charge thee therefore, 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, he says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. He says, be instant in season, out of season. He says to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Paul does not send Timothy out on a mission to be liked by everyone. Don't miss this. He does not send Timothy out to win a popularity contest. 
He does not accept, expect that Timothy is going to go and give the gospel and, and, and by giving the gospel, it will be so fuzzy and round that everyone will just be drawn to Timothy and, and he'll be popular and liked and he can sell a whole bunch of DVDs and books. No. Paul says, when you preach, things should be reproved. Sin should be rebuked. You should exhort. But he says that this must be done with all long suffering and doctrine. Difficult for me to talk about this, but last night when I was preaching, there were some who approached me later and said that I, I had offended them because I brought up one of my stories when I was really not talking about what I thought they thought I was talking about, but the issue of a transsexual. And I want to say that if I offended someone because they thought I was making a joke about individuals, I wasn't. And I'd even challenge them to go back and watch last night's presentation and see that I didn't laugh. I wasn't joking at all. In fact, being a physician, one of the things I've learned is that when people are in that situation, and I've worked in HIV and AIDS for many years and had many patients in that situation, it is probably one of the most difficult, confusing, challenging, and in the end, from a purely a medical and health standpoint, one of the most detrimental places a person can be. So I don't find it funny, and I was not making a joke. But I want to say that, on the other hand, I don't know that I would be a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ if somehow I wasn't plain in saying what the Bible says about it. I don't know if I should be more worried about being offensive to people or if I should be more worried about offending the living God. And believe me, I, I, I take this stuff very seriously. It's life and it's death. I understand the consequences of the words that we speak when we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Paul says, Dr. Walsh, like he says to every other person who will stand and deliver the word of God through Bible study or preaching, when you take the Bible and you stand in the place where the gospel can be preached or shared, you take on a very serious responsibility. Because one day, Every individual is going to have to stand before the very judgment seat of the living God. And what if I'm the only person that might have spoken a word of warning to an individual who is going off course? What kind of love is it if you know a house is burning and you're afraid to run inside and shout fire? Paul says we must be long-suffering. And I will admit that sometimes we as Adventists have been very short-suffering. But there are times when we're so concerned with what people are doing, we forget to ask the harder question, who do they know? Sometimes we can jump the gun and say, look, put down that cigarette, put down the alcohol, lose the weight, do those things, and never really ask the hard question, are they doing what they're doing because there's a God-sized hole in their heart? And one of the things I learned in the addiction medicine clinic that I used to work in at the Veterans Hospital in Loma Linda, when those, when those former addicts would be coming out of their addictions to, to heroin and cocaine and crystal methamphetamines and alcohol, and they would, they would stand together and they would chant at the end of their meetings. And one of the things I used to love them hear them say is when they said, God made the human heart so big that only he can fill it. We must be long-suffering because we have to understand that there are a lot of people who have this God-sized hole in their heart, and the behaviors that we see them doing are really only a reflection of the fact that they do not have the kind of relationship with God that fills the hole. And that once they're introduced to Jesus Christ and their peace, and the peace is given to them that passes all understanding, that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ, all of a sudden, how easy is it? For the things that used to, the sins and the things that used to so easily beset them to be shaken off and tossed aside. 
Let me tell you, there were times when I was involved in things in my life that I thought I could never get out of. I honestly thought at times I was trapped in certain behaviors, certain things about my life and lifestyle, and I thought I could never be delivered. But it was as I studied the Word, as I prayed, and, and what I learned is that I had to learn to stop focusing, and uh, 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 Morris Vendens writes well on this. I had to stop focusing on, on, on what I was doing and switch my focus from my behaviors onto Christ. And what I learned was that as long as my focus was on not doing things, I failed miserably. Because I was not fighting the fight of faith. I was fighting the fight of works. And what happened is, once I learned, you know what, let me just put Christ first. I can't, I can't win the battle over here. I keep losing the battle over here. I can't give up cheese. Some of y'all thought I was going to say something real drastic. <laughs> Praise God, he's delivered me from cheese. Somebody else say Amen. I can't give up milk or cheese or whatever it is, I, 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 nightclubs at one time in my life. I can't give it up, but maybe if I just focus on Jesus Christ. And you know what happens? You can't focus on Jesus and then walk into a nightclub. All of a sudden, you see the place differently. All of a sudden, the demonic influences of that nightclub, the demonic, demonic influences of the alcohol, the demonic influences of whatever it is that's in your life, of that bad relationship, the person you're being intimate with that God has, that you have no business being intimate with. As you draw closer to Christ, the Spirit of God falls on you, and the love of Christ begins to constrain you. So I tell addicts now in my practice, when I see patients and they're dealing with stuff, and if, and if they're a Christian, especially if they're a Christian, I say, listen, the first battle you must fight is the fight of faith. Because righteousness is by faith. The just shall live by faith. If you fight the fight of faith, the, the behaviors, what God is going to do is give you the knowledge that stuff is wrong. He'll tell you what's wrong as you study God's Word and you see it and you learn what's wrong. But faith is what it takes for the Spirit of God to fill you so that Jesus lives in you and you stop living in your own self. Because some of us put more emphasis on what we're doing than on Christ. And I, may, I will submit to you that if you lift up Jesus Christ in your life, He will change your life. The Ten Commandments will no longer be uh, uh, ten rules. They become ten promises. That's why I love God. He's not saying thou shalt not. He said, don't worry, you won't do that. Don't worry, you won't commit adultery. Don't worry, you're not going to steal. Don't worry, you're not going to murder because I'm in you. Paul says to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. The Scripture determines doctrine, amen? So when people come at me with stuff, and it, whether it's to the left or the right, I say, okay, show me from the Scripture. You'd be amazed how many arguments will end if you say, show me from the Scripture. <laughs> Paul says in verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. I saw someone who I actually think is a very nice man, a man named Joel Osteen, on the Larry King live show one night. Larry King just recently retired, I believe. And Joel Osteen was on and Larry King was asking him some very difficult questions, and one of the things he asked Joel Osteen, he said, do you ever use the word sinner? Joel Osteen, you can go online and look at the transcript of this. Joel Osteen says, no, you know, that's a word I never use. Larry King replies that, do you believe in the Bible? <laughs> People want teachers now that will tell them how to better manage their money how to live a more prosperous life, how to be more happy, how to find a better spouse. And not that anything's wrong with any of that. But the problem is people don't want the Word of God in their mess. They don't want to have to apply the Word of God to the parts of their lives where they're failing God. 
We want to keep our secret sins and, and hold them tight and tuck them away and, 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 and incubate them and pretend that God doesn't see what we do on the sly. And as the world and the church gets more like that, and I mean Christendom in general, as that happens, they will start to ask for preachers and teachers who will teach them what they want to hear. And in fact, it's that pressure that is changing the Seventh-day Adventist church. And I shouldn't say changing, but that pressure is on our church. Because there are a lot of pastors who simply want the numbers. We want to make sure that we fill our churches. We want to show that we've baptized so many. So there are a lot of people who say, you know what, maybe if we don't talk about the health message, maybe, maybe we'll do better at bringing people in. And I was actually in an in a evangelistic series where they decided to do that. I wasn't in it. I was, a, I was a member of the church in that small town. And I'll never forget, we, we had the baptism that Sabbath, and seven or eight people got baptized, a big number for that church. And on the way home, one of the guys that, got, that was just baptized lit up a cigarette and was smoking, driving home. And I'm driving next to it, I'm saying, well, you'd think the brother would at least wait until he got home to <laughs> smoke. And then there was a potluck, and he brought something unclean. I think he brought like a, a pork dish to the potluck. And I said, let me pull this brother aside and say, you know, you realize that the seven of in the church, um, certain things we don't eat, and there's, you know, you know, I understand if you're struggling with smoking, we can give you some help with quitting nicotine, but you know, public smoking is probably still a bad idea. And he said, what? They never told me any of this. And he left the church because he felt betrayed as if he had been conned into being baptized into the church. I think it's only fair that if you want someone to join our church that you, up front, you tell them what we believe. The scripture says in verse 4 that they would turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Big movements like the Left Behind series where they teach that Jesus is going to come and take a select bunch of people to heaven and then if you're left behind, just wait seven years and if you wait the seven years, it's like the bus stop. You know, the bus will come back around for you so you get a second chance. These are fables, not biblical at all. But they've been so popularized in the last days. So Paul says in verse 5, to watch thou in all things. He says, endure afflictions. He says to Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. He says to make full proof of your ministry. He says in verse 6, For now I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. Now you realize he, he, he understood that the Roman powers would read this, so he, I wonder if he was thinking that old Nero would be a bit upset when he reads that Paul was not afraid of death. You know, you take away the power from your oppressor or from your, or from your jailer or from your, or, or, or in this case, the person who's really trying to destroy you and your movement. The power is taken away when they realize you are not afraid of death. Paul says, I'm ready to be offered. He says, and the time of my departure is at hand because Paul did something powerful. Paul was not on the defensive in dealing with with his captors. In fact, when you read in Acts 24, 25, or in Acts 26, 28, when he's dealing with Festus and Felix and, and Agrippa, when he's dealing with these men, you realize that Paul isn't actually on the defensive. Paul uses his captivity as a tool to be on the offensive. He does what Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 18, where Christ says to Peter, Peter, you are uh, upon this rock, speaking of himself, Jesus Christ, upon this rock I will build my church. And he says, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against them. Are gates offensive or defensive uh, pieces of equipment? A gate is a defensive position. You don't put up a gate so you can run people over. Somebody ought to say Amen. What Jesus was saying is that I'm going to build my church and my church is going to run 
over the gates of hell. Some of us have that in reverse. We, you know, we live in fear. And, oh, listen, Paul understood that although he looked like the prisoner, he looked like the captive, he looked like the weak and feeble one as he stood in front of Nero, Paul understood that with God, he had all power behind him. And Paul took his captivity as an opportunity to preach the gospel, not just to the common man, but the gospel reached so high that even in Acts uh, 26 and 28, one of the Roman leaders says, you have almost convinced me of this thing. Paul was on the offensive. He was ready to die if that's what it took. And in verse 7 of 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Paul understood the importance of fighting the fight of faith. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. And I wonder as I read this, if he wasn't writing so that Nero would get this. Let's think back for a second about Nero. You see, when Nero entered his race, Nero rode his 10 horsed chariot and fell twice and never finished the race. I believe that Paul knew that it wasn't impossible that Nero or those close to Nero would read this letter. And Paul is saying, look Nero, you didn't finish your race. But guess what? I fought a good fight. I finished my race, Nero. You may not have finished your race, Nero, but I finished mine. I kept the faith. In verse 8, he says, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Nero, yeah, you got all of these paper, uh, plant-based crowns that, that are corruptible and will rot away. But Nero, I want you to know something. God is holding a crown of righteousness for me. You cheated to get your crowns, Nero. You murdered to get the crown of the emperor. You cheated to get the crowns you got in the Olympics. But my crown is a crown of righteousness, Nero. He says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me that day. Paul is really playing on the words, I think, because he's not only saying to Nero, you didn't finish your race, I finished mine. He's not only saying you cheated and got your crowns and I'm going to get a crown of righteousness. But Paul is also saying something powerful here. You bribed your judges, Nero, but my judge cannot be bribed with your money. Nero, you cannot convince the God of the universe to accept you because of your earthly power or fame or beauty. Paul is saying to Nero, listen, the judge, the God of the universe that you heard me speak about is a righteous judge. He says, the righteous judge shall give me at that day, and he says, and not to me only, I love this, but unto all them that love his appearing. You see, because after this, Nero left and went to Greece and got into all kinds of debauchery and frivolity. On his way back from Greece, he found out that the empire was in rebellion. Whole provinces, insurrection had risen up, and Galba had been pronounced as emperor. Not only did Nero and Paul live different lives, they died different deaths. Nero, when he found out, he died second. Paul died first. But Nero, when he found out that they were coming for him and he was in the palace, he could hear the armies coming for him. No more bravery. No more strength. He collapses in fear. He cries like a baby. He thinks to kill himself. But he's not even brave enough to do that. He flees just outside of the city with a few of his closest slaves. 
and he seeks to throw himself off of a bridge on his way out of the city and drown himself, but he can't even get the courage to do that. He reaches to a secluded place where he hides and he pulls out his doctor, daggers and, and in the theatrical way that he wanted to live, he pulls out his daggers and acts as if he'll kill himself, but he's too scared. He drops the daggers and falls to the ground. Eventually, Nero begs one of his slaves to run the dagger through his neck. Nero dies an ignoble, inglorious death at the hand of a slave. How different is Paul's death? Paul died first. History and tradition tell us that as Paul is being led out, Nero doesn't want anyone to see Paul's death because Paul had this funny thing about him. It was as if Paul just bumped into somebody. They came to know Jesus Christ. So they said, look, isolate this brother, and if we're going to kill him, only send him out with the assassins and let no one know that he's going to die. But as the weak, feeble, by now emaciated Paul is being led to be slaughtered, unlike the babbling, crying Nero, Paul is singing songs of praise to his God. The executioners can't even understand it. There's not an ounce of fear on Paul's face. He smiles at his captors and at the executioners as they bring him outside of the city and, and kneel him down and lay his head on the block to kill him. Before they can raise a sword and, and, and take the sword to his neck, Paul is sure to forgive them of what they're about to do. How different Paul and Nero. What a contrast between the two men. One died clinging to a crown that was really never his. While the other Paul dies with the faith that there's a crown laid up waiting for him. GYC, let me tell you, the, it's really important that you claim your crown. I want to close by giving you some beautiful scriptures about the crown. James 1, verse 12. James 1 and verse 12 said, Blessed, bless says, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Paul understood that if he could endure, he would receive the crown of life. But the Bible goes even further. The last of the apostles alive, John the Revelator, in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10, Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. He says, Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. This is Jesus speaking to the church at Smyrna. Fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison that you might may be tried, and you shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. Scripture says that if you can be faithful unto death, and sometimes we think that's the death of the martyr, but let me submit to you that even before that, that is death to self, death to pride. My favorite verse about crowns is found in Revelation chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. As Jesus is speaking to the church at Philadelphia, Revelations 3, 10 and 11, talking about claiming your crown now. Verse 10 and 11, he says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. You notice that it's Jesus who does the keeping us, uh, from, of us from temptation. 
He says, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Verse 11 is profound. Verse 11 says, behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man takes your crown. Claim your crown, GYC. Claim your crown. We're told that the angels in heaven were seen resizing the crowns so that they would fit someone else's head. It is imperative, it is, it is important that each of us claims the crown because the beauty of this message is that before anything happens, your crown is already assigned to you. The beauty of the message is that your name is already written in the Lamb's book of life. And what we must do is live our lives so that our names remain there. We must live our lives so that in the book of works, our pages are covered in the blood red of Jesus Christ. Claim your crown. Those verses were very important to me in, Revel in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4, five years ago, when I got word that my mother was ill. She was suffering from multiple myeloma. Diagnosed at Jackson Memorial Hospital in Miami by one of our good Adventist physicians that worked there. Let me encourage the young people. So many of you have come up to me and said you're interested in medicine. Let me tell you that there's a powerful ministry for Christian physicians and healthcare workers of all kinds. And in a time when our family was in need and I was on the West Coast and my mother was in Miami, it was powerful that this Adventist physician was able to show up and properly diagnose her where no one else did. Multiple myeloma. I read in one of my medical books that it was two and a half to three year life expectancy. When you're raised three sons and a single mother, my father left when I was just two years of age. My mother was such a beautiful Christian, she told us later on that it was probably a good thing that he left because he couldn't stand the Seventh-day Adventist church. And she would have never been able to raise us in the church that saved us. My mother went through so much difficulty, so much heartache in her life. And now at the end, she was battling cancer. She fought valiantly for two or three years, however long it was, and finally my brother called me and told me I needed to come to Miami. I got off the plane and my brother's a pretty tough guy. He was crying as he picked me up in his car and we went to the hospital to see her and I'll never forget walking in and seeing my mother from the cancer and the chemotherapy. So shriveled up, so skinny, her natural short hair. Seeing her that sick for the first time I couldn't take it and I retreated into the bathroom, fell on my knees and I began to agonize with God. Lord, after all this woman did in service to you, pathfinder leader, treasurer for the church, Lord, she was so faithful for so many years, how could you allow your, your daughter to go out like this? I began to agonize with God. Lord, if you're a God of mercy, why is she suffering like this? I was sobbing, kneeling on the floor in the bathroom of her hospital room. Ironically, the hospital that she was an administrator in, the Sylvester Comprehensive Cancer Center in Miami, Florida. Sobbing and agonizing with God. And I'll never forget I was there crying, it was as if a voice spoke to me and said, don't worry about your mother. She has been perfected. 
and it dawned on me that the verses 7 and 8 of the fourth chapter of 2 Timothy applied to my mother. She was happy. In fact, we sang, what a, what a friend we have in Jesus, all the way till she fell asleep in Jesus. She was fine with going to sleep because she was ready to see her Jesus. She was ready to claim her crown. As the appeal song is sung, you want to make sure you claim your crown. I just want you to join me down front. You want to claim that crown. I will change your name. You shall no longer be called wounded outcast lonely or afraid I will change your shall be confidence, joyfulness, overcoming one, faithfulness, friend. change your name. You shall no longer be called wounded, outcast, lonely, or afraid. Change your name.